Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio show. I'm your host, Robert Helms. You can learn a lot as a real estate investor from folks that have come before you. And today you're going to meet an extraordinary investor and best-selling author that's going to help you manage your finances and your emotions as you build your real estate portfolio. Today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms, and joining me as usual in the co-host seat, it's Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. You know, we love to talk to folks who are out in the market doing real estate deals, not just thinking about real estate, not just getting educated about real estate, although those are important, but really folks that have been there, done that, and have what we call seat knowledge. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. You said joining me as usual in the co-host seat. Uh, next month will be my 18th anniversary of sitting in this seat. And so we've seen a lot of things happen in those 18 years. Obviously, we started out together on the front end of the great financial crisis. We had a wild ride in the big run-up and the big real estate boom in the early 2000s. Uh, we had it all blow up in our face in 2008. And uh, coming out of that, we took the radio show, which had been going on since 1997, and turned it into a podcast. Of course, we continued to do the radio show. And as I got more involved in managing that side of our business, uh, I started seeing all these uh, upstarts, these new broadcasters, podcasters coming out. And that was a lot of fun. And it opened up a whole new community, at least for me, uh, to see how people were doing business and what they were focused on and what they had questions about and what they were learning. And, and then everybody kind Kind of you know moved in their direction obviously we gravitated towards syndication and some of the things that we've talked about over the years but getting a chance to talk with people that are talking with people that are out in the street doing whatever it is in their niche we've talked to a lot of people over these last 18 years in various markets various product niches various investment strategies all that kind of stuff but today we get a chance to talk to someone who really has some visibility really has some exposure on what's going on on Main Street. So I am super, super excited about today's show. You know, folks are always asking, what's the shortcut? What's the secret? What's the way to get into the real estate business? And I think one of the biggest things is community, who you hang out with. A lot of real estate investors tend to be lone wolves, right? They're off there doing their own thing and they bucked the company trend and all that stuff. And that's great. But at the same time, you got to have people you hang around that you can have as a sounding board, that you can get ideas from, that you can brainstorm with. And a community is a missing element in a lot of places. If it's just you and whatever you can consume and webinars and, and online content, well, you'll get to a certain level. You know, that's what we might call head knowledge, brain knowledge. I'm going to read, I'm going to learn, I'm going to study, all of which you should be doing. But then you've got to get around folks. And we're big believers in that. Obviously, if you listen to our show, you know that we're always encouraging to come out and come to our events, come to other events, uh, meet people, start an investment club, be in an investment club, because that's where the rubber meets the road. You've got to get educated, but you also have to put together a group of folks who has each other's back. And this can be on a very small and very local level, or it can be on a on a big level. Yeah, we're a little old school. You know, we're a couple of guys that come with doing seminars, live events. We had a, a mentoring club, big program in Silicon Valley back in the day. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people came through that program. And then as the shift uh, started to move online and the people who have really had the ability to build the online communities, the principle is the same. You know, now it's kind of hybrid. People 
uh, have online communities and they get together in live events. We've been big believers in conferences and networking events. There's been real estate investment clubs going forever in, in this business. And so however you choose to do it, the important thing is plug into a group of people that are speaking the language, that have their thumb on the pulse of what's going on in the market, that have access to deal flow, access to capital, that are solving problems on a daily basis. And then when you get in a position where you can share that information, whether it's in a forum, a chat, uh, a mastermind group, however you choose to do it, when you plug into people that are out there solving the same problems you're going to be facing every day, you compress time frames. You compress how fast you can get from uh, being stuck and being stagnated and trying to figure out what to do next to being able to get unstuck and get going. And the other thing is, is sure, you're going to make mistakes, but the consequences of those mistakes are a lot lower when you mitigate them sooner, you recognize them earlier, uh, and then you learn from other people's experiences. So that's all part of what happens in uh, the real estate community, the real estate investing community. We're happy to be a part of it. We're happy to uh, bring to your guest today that has been a big, big part of that, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Our guest today checks a lot of boxes. If you're new to real estate investing, he has a story about how he got started, which maybe you can relate to, full-time career doing something else and finding real estate. Uh, uh, he also is a best-selling author and has shared some great ideas uh, with folks that way. He also is the host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. When we come back, you're going to meet our friend David Green today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. The Real Estate Guys are throwing a party and you're invited. Join us live at the New Orleans Investment Conference, October 12th through 15th. Now in its 48th year, it's the nation's longest running investment conference and features some of the biggest names in economics and investing, including Jim Rickards, Danielle DiMartino Booth, Rick Rule, Doug Casey, James Grant, and George Gammon. And of course, the Real Estate Guys are speaking again this year. Plus, we're hosting an awesome party one of the evenings with some very special guests. So make plans today to join the Real Estate Guys at the New Orleans Investment Conference. With all that's going on in the world, no serious investor can afford to miss it. Send an email to neworleans at realestateguysradio.com and we'll get you all the details. That's neworleans at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, ever wished you could go back in time and do some tax planning? Now you can, just like Marty McFly. Lucky for you, a brand new federal law just made this possible with an EQRP to get tax deductions and reduce your taxable income from last year, so you can use that tax savings to invest in real estate, Bitcoin, gold, even your own business. Whether you're a full-time investor, doctor, government employee, even if you have five or 50 employees, the EQRP works and is your secret weapon, and now it's retroactive. Hey, I'm Damian Lupo, and we have your solution. By the way, if you got bad advice and used an IRA for an apartment syndication, you are sitting on a U-bit time bomb. But don't worry, there's a solution, the EQRP. The EQRP company is ready to help you get control of your money, kill U-bit, and help you pay way less taxes. Want to learn more about this strategy? Send an email to eqrp at realestateguysradio.com for my special EQRP report. Paying tax or letting Wall Street suck you dry is dumb. Your first step is freeing your retirement money by sending an email to eqrp at realestateguysradio.com today. Hi, this is Lawrence, your chief economist with National Association of Realtors, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program, now in our 26th year of broadcast. We're glad you're here today. We're talking about the big picture, real estate, what's happening, and how you, as an individual investor, can build the community and the resources you need uh, to help us have that discussion Welcome a gentleman who is right in the hot seat in many of the topics we've talked about. Uh, let's say hi to David Green. Hey, David. Good morning, gentlemen. How's it going? It's great. It's great to see you. I know you're busy as can be, but I thought that you know, a lot of folks obviously listen to the Bigger Pockets podcast. They probably know you in that regard. Maybe they've read one of your awesome books. But if we can, let's start before that. You know, you were a, a police officer of all things. Uh, take us through kind of your background and how you found real estate. I totally fell into this thing bass backwards. So I was going to college. I graduated in around, I think it was 2006 that I graduated college. So I had about five years because I changed my major and I saved up a lot of money when I was in school. So I was working as a waiter. I worked a lot. I didn't really get into the whole college as an experience you have to have. That just never made sense to me. I felt like the practical reason we go to college is to learn a skill. 
to hopefully go make money. And I didn't know what skill I wanted to use. So I had a lot of anxiety when I was in college. Like, I just don't know what direction I want to take. So I really put more emphasis on making and saving money, working as a waiter. And I worked in nice restaurants. It wasn't like an Applebee. So I would drive about an hour to get to work, work my shift, drive back. And then I commuted to school too. So I was really good at saving money. When I graduated college, this was in 2005, I had my car paid off, my school paid off, and I had about $110,000 saved up in the bank. So I didn't know it, but I basically walked this account right into like the biggest crash we'd ever had. So I get a job as a deputy sheriff and in 2009, the market starts to crumble. Maybe, maybe a little bit earlier that year, I bought my first place the end of 09. And then I bought another one in 2010, another one in 2011. And it was kind of just, I had saved all this money and I knew I needed a house. Once I bought a house, I thought, well, I'll get another one. I didn't know anything about, I didn't know how to calculate ROI. I didn't know investors were supposed to calculate ROI. I knew that it, it would make more than I was going to cost me to own it. And that was about as, as much as I understood about real estate investing. And at that era, everyone was telling you, don't buy houses. This is the worst time to invest. You heard a lot of this kind of talk going along. I, I should have been buying more. But I, I did. I bought one every year and it was scary because I, you know, we thought that the house, the market was going to crash even more. And then around 2013, the market took off. It just boom, like all the short sale people in, in 2009, 2010 that had been in the game all came back. And in California, at least it just got so hot, you couldn't get a house anymore. So that's when I started to get into out-of-state investing and I kind of put together that process. And the next thing I know, I'm like, I guess I'm a real estate investor. I, I bought these houses, but it was, it was not an intentional thing, which is funny because we're always giving people advice. You need to be intentional about your goals, but I kind of just fell into this one. Well, it's interesting. Uh, one of the books you've written is about long distance and investing. I like to say, live where you want to live and invest where the numbers make sense. And many people, they know the market they're in. They do like you did. They bought a house to live in and they thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll get another one. This one's worked out pretty well and someone else can make the payment. Uh, but when you cross over a border of a city or a county or a state or even a country, the whole world changes. So share with us some of the things you figured out as you became a long distance investor. The first thing that I learned is that real estate investing is a system. There is a system of steps that need to be taken and a system of due diligence that needs to be done. And if you can find the pattern in what you're doing, you really can invest anywhere and it doesn't have to be dangerous. What makes investing dangerous isn't investing in, the, in a location that isn't where you live. It's investing in a location that you don't understand. And so I started investing in Phoenix because California got too expensive and no one told me that I wasn't supposed to do it. And when I got there, I just kind of thought, well, I need a painter in California. How do I get a painter? So I asked some of the people involved in the transaction, do you know any painters? And I went through a couple of frogs and then you find your prints and boom, you got a painter. And I put their name on my little spreadsheet under painter. And then I would do the same thing for the property manager, or the HVAC repair guy. And it was, it sort of just seemed like common sense to me at the time that, Hey, this is what I do in California. I need to do it out there. And when someone would say, Hey, what do you think about this house? Well, I didn't know about that house. I didn't know about that area. I don't live in Phoenix. So I would go ask the property managers. And when you get a good property manager, they would say, oh, you definitely don't want to buy over there. This is all the problems that come from over there. You want to be in this zip code and here's why. And I thought, well, th they get this because they're constantly renting out houses. I, I mean, in my opinion, I think property managers are the salt of the earth. These are, we're always unhappy with what they do, but they're the lymph node of this whole system. They got to deal with the stuff no one wants. That's the first thing you leverage out is property managing. So they see where all the problems come and they can't make money unless it goes smooth. They run on very tight margins. So I got very dependent on property managers and their advice when it came to where I should buy and where I shouldn't. And I started to just put my whole strategy together around that is they would tell me, here's the parts of town you want to be in. Here's what you want to avoid. I would have my agent put a search together in that area. I'd find the houses that came out. I'd have the agent present me with comparables. I would run those comparables by another investor or another property manager and make sure that they said, yes, this looks right. I'd buy the house and I'd start asking the property manager, hey, do you know anyone that can fix these things? And eventually it just sort of evolved into this thing that really wasn't rocket science like what people had made me think it would be. Well, that's a great point that it is simple, but unless you have a system, unless you know what to do and you started out not knowing what to do and like many of us, some of it's trial and error. Some of it's finding a great property manager that can give you referrals and ideas. And that's part of this idea of community and building a team around you. And, and then it is a repeatable thing. I'd like to think that we all get better as time goes by. We get better because we do some things right, but we also get better because we step in it a bunch. Mm. And uh, and I think that's the thing people are kind of scared to do, which is why I love this, the whole idea of community so much. Obviously, everyone knows bigger pockets. It's a great community for folks to be able to 
ask questions and get insight and look at all kinds of different ideas and markets and, and places. Talk about how you got involved with Bigger Pockets. That was another thing I just fell into. So funny. So a lot of things in life, I find that when I look back at how it happened, a door was opened and I just did the best job I could. And then that led to more doors being opened. And that's a lot of the advice I give to younger people that that want a blueprint. They want to pay some influencer on social media to teach them the steps to becoming wealthy. And I, just, I, I don't know anyone that it works out like that. It's almost always they got an opportunity. They gave it everything they had. They built skills in that opportunity that opened up new opportunities. They did the same thing there and they stuck with that over time and it turned into what we now call success. But when they, like when I go back and I say, well, here's what I did, it really does look step by step and like you could reverse engineer it. But at the time, that's not the case. So I belong to a group called GoBundance and Hal Elrod, the author of The Miracle Morning was in that same group. And he had been interviewed on the podcast. And my buddy, Andrew Cushman and I, he's a multifamily investor. We're sitting there like, how did Hal get on to the Bigger Pockets podcast? And we've got all these properties and he's not even an investor. This is crazy. <laughs> so we went to talk to him. He's like, oh, I can introduce you guys to Josh and Brandon. So he sends an email. And Andrew and I had a plan that we were going to go on together. Well, they responded to us separately. So we ended up both getting booked to do the show, just telling our stories. It was way easier than I would have thought. It was just Hal Elrod making the introduction. So I went on the show. And uh, at the end, Brandon said what he says to everybody. He says, that's one of the best shows we've ever done. This is classic <laughs> line. Like, you're, you're the prettiest girl I ever dated. He says it's all of them. So I said, well, thanks, man. Uh, I'd really like to write blog articles for your website because I like the blog. Could you put me in touch with the blog person? So they did. So I talked to them. I gave them a writing sample. They said, this is good. And I started submitting more blogs. But what I would do different is I would pay someone to edit them and tell me what could be done better. And then I would talk to the blog people and say, what are the topics that are trending the most on the site? What does everyone want to read versus what every other blog contributor did was they just sent what they knew. This is what's easiest for them. So I started having my articles chosen as the editor's choice. Like every single week, I was getting a lot of notoriety. And then they decided they wanted to publish a book that wasn't by Brandon Turner. So they went to the blog people and said, hey, who are your best authors? My name came up because I had the top blogs. I got offered to write long distance investing. I wrote that book. That book won a couple of awards. It did really well. That led to the next deal, which was the Burr book. But more importantly, I started going on podcasts to talk about the books that I was writing because I wanted the sales to be good so that bigger pockets would see that I was selling more books. And I developed speaking skills. I just learned how to talk. I learned how to be engaging. I learned how to use uh, inflection in your voice because no one likes to listen to this monotone drone going on and on and on. I learned how to read audiences and I could tell when I needed to kick it up or or pare it down. And that ultimately led to me going to Brandon when Josh stepped away from the podcast and saying, hey, I think I could co-host this with you. And that was a long process. But because I had those skills built, boom, I, I did better than the other people that were applying for that job. And I got chosen to be the co-host. Such a great story. There's so much there to break down. But you know the whole idea that you have to hone your craft, you have to figure out how to add value. And you took it a step further, which is to find out what the audience wants. That's pretty critical. And then to make sure you're delivering in fact, over delivering. So success leaves clues. It doesn't happen just by accident, but at the same time, a critical point I hope no one misses is that you can't script everything. The fact that you would just fall into it the way you did, be it go abundance, have the opportunity to talk to Hal Elrod and say, you know, besides Miracle Morning, how did you get on the podcast? All that stuff. And it's being prepared. Les Brown says, always better to be prepared and not have an opportunity than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. And I think it's whatever you want to do in life, start honing your craft early. You are good at the written word, which you've recognized as a different skill set than speaking and hosting and so forth. But rather than shy away from it, you kind of embraced it and jumped right in. So super great story. Thanks for that. Now, I also know that you've got into real estate brokerage and the sales side of real estate personally. Can you talk about that evolution? Yeah. So when I got to the podcast, it was it's a very precarious situation when you're working for another company. So I don't own bigger pockets. I'm contracted with them. And you have to respect that you're there to serve their purposes. But in doing that, it's going to make your star kind of grow also. Yep. Like if you're the best player in an NBA team, you're making your team better, but your brand is going to grow with that. You're going to be the one that gets the sponsorship ad. So if, you're, if you care about doing right by the customer or by your boss, you have to sort of balance, like, how do I help this help my career? But 
not at the expense of the company that I'm with. So most of the people in my space make their money by selling a course, by selling a camp, or they, they do something where they sell some form of education. Yep. But bigger pockets, whole premises, we give education for free. That's right. what we're based on, right? So I could not in good conscience go the route of, well, I will sell the knowledge I have if I'm going to be affiliated with this company, which kind of forced me to find some other way of doing things. And I recognize that you know, I can sell houses as an agent with the knowledge I have as an investor while still working for bigger pockets and there's no conflict of interest. In fact, it was almost better because I'm learning real estate from a different perspective that I can use to share when I'm, I'm going with the audience. So that was how I really got kind of deeper into the Keller Williams model. I started learning from Gary Keller. He is a great leader in the sense that he encourages agents to build a business, not have a job. And if anyone wants to do anything through leverage, what I tell people is it's one out of 10 people will succeed with learning their job. Out of those people, maybe one out of 10 will succeed with learning how to leverage other people. It is completely different skill set. It is way harder. It's hard enough to learn how to do something, but now you got to teach someone else how to do it and hold them accountable. Oh, that's way more difficult. So Gary's sort of training in that area really helped me to build a real estate team. And then I was able to, it all kind of came together with the knowledge I had about real estate. I could help our clients with, I could help the other agents get started in the business by giving them that knowledge and giving them leads to work with. And then I was able to take everything I learned about business and apply that into my investing, which gave me a new dynamic to share on the podcast. And it all kind of came together. But again, that wasn't an intentional thing. It was, I got to find some way to make money in, in integrity while working with bigger pockets. Yeah, awesome story. And uh, I think if we focus on the, the skill sets, right? What does it take to be successful? Being open to other routes, have an integrity, recognizing that, hey, I'm in a pretty good position here. Yeah. I don't want to blow that. I don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize that. But at the same time, I still want to learn. I still want to earn. And uh, I remember my dad would always talk to folks about, you know, if you're an investor, does it make sense to get your real estate license? And it's a big old, it depends. If, if your plan is to get your real estate license just so you earn referral fees, maybe that's not the best idea. But if you really are going to help people, we haven't talked about this, but I'm going to guess you've learned a ton by being involved in transactions that you aren't a principal in. You learn a ton from that. You learn a ton from seeing how so many of the decisions we make in real estate, we tell ourselves are based on facts and numbers, but they're still based on emotion. Yeah. In fact, one of the things I learned is I used to think that I make decisions based on fact and numbers, but what I learned is that facts and numbers just impact my emotions. <laughs> so I'm still <laughs> making them based on emotion. And if you want to be good in business, you got to be good with people. If you want to be good with people, you got to be good with emotions. And that's something that just did never really came as natural to me. I had a background in law enforcement, it, just the facts, man right? That's kind of the, the way that I looked at stuff. And then just my personality is that way. So it sort of forced me to bend in ways that I wasn't used to. But I learned that accomplishing your goal, getting that house under contract, getting that property manager to give you what you need, getting the pieces you need to run a successful business is a lot about building those soft skills with human beings. So you talk to a lot of folks who are thinking of buying or selling. And, uh, you know, you also obviously get an opportunity to interview a lot of folks. We'll talk about that in, in a minute. But what do you think are some of those key distinctions? You watch somebody say, I'm going to be a real estate investor, and they just don't really get it together. And other folks that might not have been the one you would have bet on on day one turn out to, to turn it on. What are some of those key distinctions? All right. So there's a lot of ways that people will answer that question. I'll hear grit, perseverance, like that, that is true. They all have to have that. But at a more practical level, I feel like there's two really big things. It's capital and then the expectations. People that have capital tend to do way better in this space. And I know it is very popular in the educational space to say, you don't need money. You can do it without money. And that is true. You don't have to have it in the same way that you don't need physical talent to make it in professional sports. There's a handful of people that have figured out how to do it without that, but they're definitely not the norm. Yep. My personal opinion, when people say, I want to invest in real estate, but I have no money is you need to take care of your no money problem before you try to get into the real estate problem. I, this is just me. I'm not speaking for bigger pockets. I'm not speaking for anyone else. I don't think real estate is meant to be your savior from uh, financial problems or a life you don't like. And it's often looked at like that. And that's how people can prey on people that want to learn how to invest because what they're, they're taking someone that really doesn't have the skill set, the knowledge base, the, they frankly have no business being in investing, but they're not happy with their life. They can't get a girlfriend, whatever it is. And they think if only I had some rental houses, everything would be better. And that's why they, they put $50,000 on their credit card and they go sign up for a, a guru course and they get scammed. 
the skills that you need to be good at this are the same as the skills that you need to be good at other things that involve work. If you show up late to your job, if you don't do a good job, if you expect other people to solve problems, if you have a bad attitude, if you think you're entitled, that's going to still be a problem when you get into real estate investing. If you are undisciplined with your money, you probably are undisciplined with your own emotions. You don't tell yourself no, you don't focus on what you're doing. That's going to be a problem when you get into real estate investing, but the consequences are way bigger. You're now dealing with potentially like losing an entire property versus when you have a job, it's mostly your boss who's taking the risk if you're not doing a great job. So there are some people who I, I do think they're fine to borrow money from someone else and get into investing, but in general, if you don't have any money, if you can't save, if you've been working hard for a while, I don't think skipping that step and jumping into real estate investing is the best bet. I think having capital is a very, very big benefit in this world. And it's sort of, this is an industry that's made for those that have capital. If you look at how you lose a house, in my opinion, two things got to go wrong. You have to not be able to make the mortgage payment at the same time that you've lost equity and you can't sell the house. Two pretty significant problems have to happen at the same time in order for you to lose a house. And people that have lost houses have all recognized, yeah, that's what it was, is the market tanked at the same time that it wasn't cash flowing. Well, if you have enough capital, one of those problems will never happen if you have enough money saved. I think too many people focus on what's the market going to do, which they can't control rather than, well, do I have enough in reserves? Am I still working to save money and put it away? The second thing that I think is expectations. The investors that do well have reasonable expectations for how they want their money to perform. Okay. So you get some of the newbies that are like, all right, I want to buy a place for 50% of the ARV with very minimal repairs in a grade A neighborhood. Uh, and I want it to be in a market that's growing very quickly. And I want to use an FHA loan to do it. And th th they're right out the gate, their expectations of how they want that property to perform because what they want it to do for their life are just unreasonable. And there's some other investor who's doing a 1031 exchange or who has some sort of tax benefit that they want to get from that property that's okay with a 4 to 5% return in a hot growing area that in 5 or 10 years is going to be doing much better, that it's worth it to them. The person who's using the FHA loan that needs a 20% ROI on their money if they're going to get out of the position they don't like, they just get bitter and they complain. And it's constantly, oh, these people are overpaying for houses and they don't know what it's worth. And they're mixing up the fact that it, that's what it's worth to you. And it's very different to somebody else. Like some of these investors that have tens of millions of dollars are willing to take a much smaller return on their money for no headache. They want to be in the best areas because that return is worth more to them. And you get brand new investors who are trying to get into the best school districts and the best neighborhoods, and they're frustrated that somebody overpays. So the investors that I see that tend to do well have lower expectations. They don't expect real estate to save their entire life in year one. They know they're playing a long game. They're like me, when I'm buying a property, I don't really, not that concerned with what it does in year one. I'm sort of giving myself a gift five to 10 years in the future. That's how I look at it. I'm going to plant this seed five to 10 years later. We'll see if I made a good decision and we'll see what doors that opens up. There could be a cash out refinance. I could sell it. It made the cash flow might be a lot more, but because I take that longer approach, I can make these moves without the fear, without the anxiety, without the crazy emotions. And if, if one thing breaks, you see some people just, oh, I made a huge mistake. I never should have invested. I lost money. Well, that it, things are going to break in real estate. That's one of the ways it works. So to sum that up, I think the two things that make people successful in this business are having capital or access to capital and having appropriate expectations. Those are golden nuggets. Our guest is David Green. He's the host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast. He's also a prolific author. When we come back, you'll get a chance to win one of his books autographed to you today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. As real estate investors, it's no secret that the real estate guys love Florida and the Sunshine State continues to receive more than its fair share of businesses and population relocating from the Northeast, which has created a huge opportunity for real estate investors. So come join Russ and me in mid-August for our Jacksonville Palm Coast Ocala field trip. On this highly interactive trip, you'll get an up-close, hands-on, personal experience you'd be hard-pressed to find elsewhere. You'll feel the vibrancy of the markets, observe the quality of the infrastructure, and truly get a sense for the demographics, all things you just can't do by simply searching online. Plus, we'll introduce you to our boots on the ground team and you'll meet some amazing investors from all over. To reserve your spot, 
Go to realestateguysradio.com and click events where you'll find the Jacksonville field trip. There's a big difference between researching a market from afar and seeing it with your own eyes. So join the Real Estate Guys as we explore not one, but three amazing real estate markets. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click events for the Jacksonville, Palm Coast, Ocala field trip. See you there. Real Estate Guys listeners, are you tired of losing real estate deals due to financing issues? Have you had enough of waiting on banks, lenders, and investor groups to fund new projects? What if there were a way to eliminate all the hassle and invest in real estate on your own terms? I'm here to tell you there is. Patrick Donahoe here from Paradigm Life. I'm an Investopedia top 100 most influential financial advisor, and I recently wrote a best-selling book about the financial strategy that changed my entire investment model and the one that could change yours. To get a copy of my book for free and learn how you can maximize your real estate portfolio by acting as your own bank, send an email to mybank at realestateguysradio.com. Don't make another real estate deal without reading my book first. Email mybank at realestateguysradio.com now to get your copy for free. Forbes rated Memphis the best cash flow market in the nation. And our good friend Terry Kerr at Mid-South Home Buyers has been the premier turnkey rental property provider in Memphis for over 13 years. With an A-plus rating for the Better Business Bureau, Terry has renovated over 750 houses. Real Estate Guys listeners have snapped up hundreds. Discover what these satisfied investors already know. Mid-South's properties are completely renovated with a one-year warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're affordable, well-managed, and easy to own. Perfect for beginning investors and veterans alike. Get in on the action. Contact Terry and his team via email at midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Sheriff Mack, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. If you want to see a couple of cool real estate markets, The Real Estate Guys have two awesome real estate field trips in August. One to Jacksonville and Ocala, Florida. One to Ambergris Key, Belize. You get all the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com. Under the tab that says events, we're talking today about managing your finances and your emotions as you build your real estate portfolio. We've got David Green from Bigger Pockets with us before we get back to that interview. It's time to give away a prize by knowing today's real estate trivia question. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you a question that has something to do with real estate. And if you're quick, the first person that gets it right is going to get an autographed copy of David's great book, Long Distance Real Estate Investing. He'll sign it to you if you're the winner. As soon as you hear the question and think you might know the answer, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. You'll need to send us your name, your guess, and your physical mailing address so David can send you this book. Last week, we were talking about investing passively with attorney Mauricio Raoul. We asked you this. There are four presidents on Mount Rushmore, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. In what U.S. state are they located? Well, that was an easy one. Most folks knew that Mount Rushmore is in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Just got back from some quality time in South Dakota. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. Where was the world's first rodeo held? Yeah, you know, the rodeo didn't always exist, but it started somewhere. Where was the world's first rodeo, if you know, or you just want to take a guess, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Give us your name, the answer to the question, and your mailing address. If you're the first to get it right, you get an autographed copy of Long Distance Real Estate Investing. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're with the author of that fabulous book, Mr. David Green. And David, you get a chance to sit in a really interesting seat. You're active with folks that are buying and selling real estate. You're active with investors. But you get to interview a lot of folks. So let's take a minute and change gears a little bit. What are some of the things that you're watching, trends you're paying attention to, stuff on the street you're hearing mm. as uh, you're talking to all these different amazing people in real estate? That's such a good point. It's one of the reasons I like uh, running the real estate sales team. And then I also have a brokerage as well that does loans. We call it the one brokerage. So we we finance people as well. And that, that business is doing incredible right now. But it, what it does is it puts me in this position, like you said, where I see changes coming in the industry before everybody else does. Yeah. 
as far as what I'm looking at, that is such a good question. The first thing I would say is the mistake people make is they're zooming in on individual details way too much. This is what happens when you get scared. When I worked as a cop, we would, uh, I was an instructor for use of force. So I would teach other police officers when you could use force, what's appropriate, what the case law is behind it, and then practical applications of what would work best. And the problem is when cops are using force, they're always doing it under massive stress that they have not been in before. And fear is a huge factor. And no one makes good decisions when they're afraid. Like anyone who's been in a relationship knows that that's true. So when we would talk to these cops, they would, they would say things like when the suspect had a gun, I don't remember anything but how big that gun was. Right. So I, we learned that the brain focuses on the thing that it is afraid of and blows it out of proportion as a survival instinct. And you see this with like a first time home buyer when they get their inspection report and they completely panic. And they basically are every single thing in that is completely blown out of proportion. It's this is a fear response. And so when people live in that state, they end up focusing on individual tiny metrics to determine like, what should I do today? This is how day traders get addicted to looking at what stocks go up and down. And we're seeing a lot of crypto people that are completely devastated and crushed because their stuff just dropped this far, but they were on cloud nine a month ago when it went up just as easily as it came down. Right? Like it's, right. it's not a healthy way to live when you're, when you're let your emotions get this tied to something as insignificant, a lag indicator, like what's crypto worth today. So one thing that I pay attention to is macroeconomics. I think in general, I get way more credit for being smarter than I really am when it comes to real estate investing. I think I just spent my money in a smart way. I put it into housing instead of into cars and I waited and let inflation do a lot of heavy lifting and I just live beneath my means. It, that wasn't an intelligent thing. That was sort of more of just like a marathon. Like I just stayed focused to the goal that I was doing. And it made me look really smart that these houses went up a lot, but it's inflation that made it go up. I, I would say, Robert, there's a good chance if someone adjusted for inflation, my investments might not have actually made money. They might have just kept pace with whatever inflation was. And it gave me the appearance that I'm making money. So I pay a lot of attention to what the Fed is doing because it's it's sort of, a, you know, if you look at the individual property, you can feel really good about what you're doing. But if you look at the big picture, you, you realize, well, maybe it's not as much as what I thought. And I think uh, one mistake people make is like when it comes to inflation, they'll look at the CPI. They'll say, okay, what does the CPI say today inflation is? Inflation's at 5.8%. No, it's not. That's what the CPI is reflecting. <laughs> inflation could be closer to 30% if you look at how much money that we're actually printing, right? So by focusing on that individual tiny detail and not the bigger picture, investors make decisions as like, oh, I should wait because this is going on. Like interest rates went up. Okay, that means that housing prices have to come down. That's something that I'm hearing all the time is prices go up. They're going to be less affordable. Sellers are going to have to drop their prices so people can buy their house. It's not true at all. It depends on what market you're in. And markets that I'm investing in have such a little amount of supply compared to the amount of demand that interest rates aren't really affecting it whatsoever. If you had 12 buyers and rates knocked out half of them, you're still getting six offers on every house. That's not going to make prices come down. So focusing on interest rates is like, I would say the amateur move. They're looking at the wrong information. They should be looking at overall supply and demand and then asking the question, how do interest rates, how do tax changes, how do these individual things that we're talking about affect the bigger picture? So like, there's a lot of talk right now, like we've heard since before he was even president, the president Biden has said he wants to get rid of the 1031 exchange. And I know that there's some information going on right now saying we need to stop this from happening. And I'm saying right now, the wrong move is to say they got rid of the 1031 exchange, real estate prices are going to come down. I can see a scenario where the opposite thing would happen, where now there's no reason to sell your property because you're going to have a massive tax gain. So you're going to keep it. It's going to take supply off the market that used to be there, and it's going to actually make prices go back up. So I guess that was a long-winded way of answering your question, but I'm encouraging people to look at the big picture first and then ask yourself, what relationship do these details have to the big picture as opposed to what relationship do those details have to the actual property that you want to go buy? Well, no secret that we love that answer. Uh, we have made a concerted effort in the last many years to focus on the big picture, not just the weeds in real estate, but reality is you need both. You have to know how tenant landlord law works in your state. You have to know what a lease obligates you to do. You have to know about market analysis, but at the same time, you got to get your head out of the sand. You know, 
know, with your perspective as a lender, right, and being in that business, that's another kind of early indicator. You start to see when not the lenders we think of, but the, the secondary lenders, the wholesale lenders make their decisions about the kind of programs they make and cash out refis and all that. Anything you see on that end? Yeah, this is a, a I don't know why more people don't talk about this fact. It's kind of scary. Most people look for houses on websites like Zillow, Realtor, Redfin, which are just portals into the MLS. What you're doing is you're looking into the inventory that real estate agents control through people that have put their houses uh, on the market through an agent. Well, there's a buttload of stuff that used to go to the MLS that doesn't anymore. Wholesaling is a, is a very big business now, and it's siphoning off stuff that used to come to the average person that would look in there. And, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give legal advice. I, I think a lot of wholesalers are probably in a gray area and they might be on the wrong side of a line that just isn't being enforced. But because it's it's always odd to me, and I know I'm sort of biased because I am a real estate agent, but the level of regulation you have to go through when you try to do something right when you're licensed is insane. And then the wholesalers are kind of operating in the wild, wild west, and there's zero regulation. They can just do anything they want. Well, it's taking a lot of inventory that used to go to the public to be seen. And it's going to the guys like me that have an inside track on those wholesalers. It's If you're just a normal investor listening to this show and you want to go buy property, you're never even going to see it. Some experienced person is going to buy it and they're maybe buying in bulk before it gets to you. And the other thing is institutional capital. They are a giant in the markets where they're working in. So I just sold a, a ton of my property. This is actually, a, I haven't talked about this publicly before, but I had a person who figured out the name of one of my legal entities and stole title to 25 properties that I owned wow. Yeah, out of the state of Florida. He's in jail now, thank God. But it, it took about a year to get title back to those things. And then I ended up selling them just because I didn't want it to happen again. I'm like, I can't risk that happening. Well, I sold it to a hedge fund that paid me almost twice what the highest bid I got from the individual investors that were valued in the portfolio ridiculous how much money they're deploying. And so I started asking around. And in these markets where they're operating, which are typically cash flow heavy markets, stuff that's close to the 1% rule, there's wholesalers that are going to a... So a wholesaler will put a, a house in contract from your mom, right? And they got at a pretty good price. And then they will assign it to another wholesaler who will pay them their margin. And then that wholesaler will go assign it to the institutional capital or the hedge fund and make a whole bunch of money. That's how much these guys are paying for these assets. And I, and I see that the small mom and pop person just sitting there pounding their fist on the table and saying, oh, they're, they're overpaying for these properties and prices have to come down. And they don't realize they're competing with a company with literally billions of dollars that's on a 20 year horizon as far as this. And they know that we can't lose. Real estate's going to continue to go up in price. We have so much in reserves that we are fine no matter what happens. They're playing the game like we wish that we could play it and they're beating the individual people. And I'm and I'm not trying to sound like sour grapes because they're able to, to do that, right? Like I, I'm not against legislation to prevent that, but I'm also not going to sit here and say, we need to do something to stop this. That's however that plays out is how it plays out. But you need to know this if you're the person listening to these shows and trying to educate yourself and having this idea in your mind that prices have to come down. Like there's so many more people competing for these assets that are in the space that we love that I don't know that prices have to come down. In fact, I think that there's room they could actually go up, especially if we keep printing money like we are. All right, good stuff. Hey, before we get you out of here, David, uh, we're excited that uh, the Bigger Pockets Conference is coming up later this year, October in San Diego. Tell us about it. Bigger Pockets Conference is one of the most fun times you're ever going to happen to have. So it's a bunch of real estate investors that get together to learn from people that teach about real estate investing. I've never seen like a sour face the entire time I've been there. It's just that community in general. One of the reasons I like it is there's not a lot of buttheads. It just tends to draw good people. Like, like you guys, I, I feel like have the same sort of aura about you. I can't imagine a jerk showing up to one of your events or listening to your show and wanting to be there. <laughs> so if you're looking to have a good time, if you're looking to meet new people, if you're kind of intimidated or scared by real estate, this is a great environment for you to be involved in. It's sort of the opposite of when you go to these like big, fancy, multifamily type events where they use big words and graphs and data and they speak in a very boring way. And like, I feel like in the multifamily space is just my opinion. They'll take really simple things and put fancy names on them so that they can sound smarter. Like you'll hear them talk about a retrade. 
you're like, wow, retrade. Like that hap- That just means I got the inspection report and I want a lower price. That happens in everything, right? Or they'll throw out an agency debt. That's another one that you hear people talk about. And it, and it creates this intimidating environment where you hear these words, I don't really know what they're saying. And so you, you stop getting involved into it versus at a, at a bigger pockets conference, we're going to be speaking plainly. It doesn't matter if you own 20 houses or if you've never bought a house, you're going to have a good time and you're going to learn some stuff. So I would encourage anybody who sort of wants to get deeper into this culture and into this community community to, to check that out. Awesome. Great stuff. Hey, it happens October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, and it's going to be in beautiful San Diego, California. To get all the details and a direct link to sign up, just send an email to biggerpockets at realestateguysradio.com. Biggerpockets at realestateguysradio.com. The Real Estate Guys are going to be there. We'll hang out with you as well. It's going to be an awesome event, a great community. And back just to the whole idea of building a community. You guys have done a monstrously awesome job at that. Get out from behind your computer and and come visit with many of the folks that you're talking to uh, in the forums. And uh, who knows, one great idea, and you know there's going to be dozens, uh, will be worth it for sure. Hey, we sure appreciate you sharing your time and a lot, of, a little bit of your backstory uh, today, David. It's been awesome catching up with you. Thanks, guys. It's good to see you guys again. There's David Green of Bigger Pockets and more. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Elms. Real Estate Investment Advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, it's Robert Helms. Thanks so much for listening to the show today. I want to personally invite you to come see an amazing real estate market that combines excellent cash flow, offshore diversification, and what we affectionately call lifestyle investing. Come join me from August 26th to 29th in the beautiful country of Belize. The Real Estate Guys have been bringing investors to Belize for more than 15 years now, and our discovery trip is designed to show you the market like nobody else can. Sure, Belize is breathtakingly beautiful, the people are wonderful, and wait till you taste the food. But the real opportunity is the real estate investment potential. Demand for offshore real estate has skyrocketed since the coronavirus shutdown, and with retirees looking for lifestyle, the work-from-home workforce able to be productive from afar, and tourism coming back strong, now may be the perfect time to consider Belize as a place to diversify risk in your investment portfolio. There's all types of opportunity in Belize when it comes to real estate investing, including both long and short-term rentals, commercial and retail triple net properties, business opportunities, land acquisition, development, agriculture, and more. And as the only country in Latin America with English as its official language, it's easy to understand the law. Property rights are strong, and real estate contracts are in English. And at Ambergris Key, a unique situation exists where demand for rentals continues to outstrip supply, creating a compelling environment for investors. So come see for yourself. Join me in August in Ambergris Key, Belize, as we study the market, learn about the sustainable drivers, and tour lots of beautiful real estate. And like all of our field trips, there are no properties for sale during the weekend. Rather, you'll meet lots of local providers that will help educate you about the market so that you can follow up with them after the trip if the market is interesting to you. You've heard about Belize and the Real Estate Guys for all these years. Now come see what all the excitement is about. Plus, we'll have lots of time over meals and activities to talk about all things real estate. To get the details, go to the website at realestateguysradio.com and click on events where you'll find the Belize Discovery Trip. Once you register, you'll get information about our group hotel rates as well as travel details. So join me in Belize, August 26th to 29th. It's a beautiful country with lots of amazing possibilities. And the only thing missing is you. Go to realestateguysradio.com under events and I look forward to seeing you in beautiful Belize. Hi guys, my name is George Gammon from the Rebel Capitalist Show and you are listening to the Real Estate Guys, my favorite podcast when it comes to macroeconomics and real estate investing. And welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. If you want to do bigger deals or you want to get involved with bigger deals passively, then you ought to come out to the secrets of successful syndication. We do it twice a year. The next one is in September in Dallas, Texas. All the details at our website at realestateguysradio.com under the tab that says events. And under that tab, you'll also see that we're going to be at the Bigger Pockets Conference in San Diego. My goodness, what some amazing nuggets we got from David Green. Yeah, there's no substitute for experience and uh, the visibility that you have when you are interacting with a lot of thought leaders and are talking to a lot of people who are in the streets 
And obviously in his seat, just like we are in our seat, we get a chance to do that. And he came up with some really, really good stuff. I mean, I have this whole laundry list I don't have time to go through, but I would say, and maybe I'm a little bit biased because I love macro, but I think the idea that you need to look at the macro and you need to play the long game and these big, huge hedge funds are doing exactly that. They can see the macro trend. They know that inflation is a problem and it's not going to be fixed easily. They know that real estate is arguably the best or at least in the top two or three best hedges against inflation. And if you're playing the long game, that idea of having reasonable expectations, I remember Back in San Jose, California, uh, I had bought a house and I paid $224,000 for it. It was in terrible shape. Uh, another house came available for $210,000 and I thought that it was only worth $185,000 based on it was even worse shape than mine. And so I passed. Of course, today that house is worth nearly $2 million, right? So in the overall scheme of things, that overpaying meant zero. And what I really lost was the opportunity to make all that equity because obviously equity happened. You can't make any money on a property you don't own. Great market, great property, great area. Yes, it was hot. Yes, I could have and should have overpaid. I didn't. I walked on the deal and lost big. And I think of all the things he said, I think that was probably the single most valuable for our audience today and what's going on in the macro today and what's going on in real estate today. You know, I appreciated his candor about the two answers being capital and expectations. Like capital is a thing. We used to say if you have no job and you have no credit and you have no savings, you have no future. I mean, you got to do something. And I think there's too many folks that have long held the belief that zero money down, you don't make any money to make money and all that. And it's just not true. And he called that out. And then later when we were talking about hedge funds, think about what hedge funds have. They have proper expectations. They're not getting rich quick and they got a lot of capital. And his comment about, you know, when I buy a property, I don't even worry about the first year. Exactly. Time heals all wounds in real estate. You decide to back out of that property. The guy that bought the property and paid more than you were willing to got all of that appreciation. So great, great, great lessons. If you're not already listening to the Bigger Pockets podcast, you ought to be doing that. They got great guests. They talk about all kinds of different subjects. Uh, we go way back with Brandon Turner, who's no longer uh, on the show because he's also uh, been doing bigger and, and awesome things. I'm sure he'll be part of the conference. But to get details about all that, if you're not familiar with what they're doing, and especially if you want to come join us at the conference, the real estate guys are going to be hosting kind of a cool party around the event. If you want to be invited to that, then send an email to biggerpockets at realestateguysradio.com. You'll get the details in the conference coming up. We'll see you there, and we'll keep you on the list for the super secret backstage real estate guys party. A big thanks to David Green for sharing his words of wisdom today and for the work he does across the board in real estate. Next week, we've got a great show for you. It'll be the first of two shows in a row that we recorded at the 20th Annual Investor Summit. Lots of great guests and cool ideas. Until then, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at BeYourBank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers, low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.